I'm going to make some charcoal for my forge and I'm going to show you how I do that. But what you might be wondering is why? And I don't mean why make it instead of buy it. That should be obvious. Uh, five pound a bag and I reckon 50p a minute burning time. I mean, why use charcoal at all? Why not just use wood? And my bombshell answer for you is that raw wood doesn't burn. I've got some wood here. These bits are from an old pallet that I've been chopping up. We'll stick some of these in a flame and I'll show you what I'm on about. And instantly when I do this, it'll also demonstrate the process of making charcoal. So to begin with, the wood is full of volatile material and when you heat it, that's going to be driven out and that will make an orange flame. So we're starting here with a blue flame from the propane. When I put a piece of wood in, we'll get an orange yellow flame coming out of there. And that's all the volatiles being driven out of the wood. The exact same thing happens if you strike a match. So instead of having a blowtorch to start the match, you're just using a bit of friction material, you drag it along that and the heat will ignite the chemicals in the head of the match but then when the match is burning it's burning those volatiles in the matchstick and as they're coming out of the match or the taper in this case it decomposes and it decomposes into charcoal and that smouldering charcoal can then drive the process a bit more now this is soft wood and it's full of resin which is why it's spitting there can you see that yellow flame I was on about? And then if we can get the stick hot enough, it will sustain a flame of its own. So you see the end here is glowing charcoal, and then the volatiles are being pushed out of the wood further up. And that's the flame that you're seeing. So now if I take the end of the stick, that's turned into charcoal and I put it back in the flame you'll see there's no more flame that's going to come out the charcoal section the flame can only come out of the bits that are not charcoal further up so you see it burns orange but we don't get that yellow if I put it a bit further in we get the yellow flame coming out again See there's no flame coming out of this bit, but a flame coming out there. So once again that tip, which is now charcoal, we get the orange there, but no flame. And if I push it a bit further in, then we get the yellow flame. The process goes then, heat the wood, which will release the volatiles and they'll flare. And then you can use that flaring, that flame, to light more pieces of wood and so on and so forth. And you've got yourself a fire. As that's going on, the wood is decomposing as the volatiles are being driven out. And the decomposing woods become charcoal. And given enough airflow, that charcoal will itself burn and that will provide the heart of the fire. And carry on driving it along. So by considering what's going on there in that fire with the hot heart of the fire, the burning charcoal and all the airflow around that, which is then driving more volatiles off and making those flare. And you can see why you need kindling to start a fire, why you can't just apply lighter to a log and hope for the best. It's all about surface area. And this bundle of sticks and this started off the same, but think about the surface area available there for flaring off volatiles compared to the surface area that I've generated by chopping up a piece of it. Why does this matter? Well, it matters because this whole process, this constant cycle that's going on inside a fire, takes energy in itself just to keep going. You're only getting heat from a fire as a byproduct. The primary product of a fire always has to be sustaining itself. Plus, throw in the fact that even super well seasoned wood like this is still 20% moisture. So there's 20% water inside here, which has got to be driven off as well. So it's an inefficient process. So imagine if we could get rid of the water, get rid of the volatiles, and just have the charcoal, and make that burn. 
So we've established then that it's charcoal that we're after rather than just raw wood. So charcoal has no moisture in it, it has no volatiles, it is in fact pretty much pure carbon. So how do we get there? Well it's dead simple, we just take the wood and we cook it. And to avoid the charcoal being combusted in the process, we just restrict the oxygen. So no oxygen, no combustion. But we need to cook it to a high enough temperature that we drive out any water that's in there, we drive out the volatiles and we make the wood itself decompose into charcoal. So we've got to get it pretty hot and without any oxygen. And the best way to do this is with a retort kiln and that's what I built years ago. I don't have one running at the moment but it is the best way of doing it I think. I can, I'll have a go at demonstrating how a retort kiln works. So if we imagine that this coffee can is actually a cylinder that's about six foot long and three or four foot across and it stands on legs and is covered in insulation. It's a fair bit of imagining there. And then we stuff it full of the wood that we want to turn into charcoal. So we completely ram it full and then affix a airtight door on the front but that door has a pipe in it and the pipe comes out down and then underneath. Other than that this is sealed up. Then what we do is light a fire underneath and that fire will, because all of this is insulated, this is effectively an oven, so that fire gets everything really hot in here and once it gets up to a certain temperature all the steam, all the water that's in this wood will come off as steam and then all the volatiles come off. So everything is being driven off of there but there can't be any combustion because it's only one way. You're heating this lot and everything that's coming off of the wood can only go out this pipe and down and underneath. Now the great thing about the retort kiln is as those volatiles come down and underneath they will flare. So you light the fire underneath with scrap wood. So what I used to do is to fill it up with hardwood and then I'd light the fire underneath using softwood, softwood offcuts I got given for free. And like I say, once this is really going, you then get the flare coming out and then it's a self-sustaining chain reaction. And it just goes faster and faster. It's quite ferocious when it's on full chap. But once all the volatiles are gone, that means that everything inside has turned to charcoal. All the volatiles end up being burnt underneath and it puts itself out. So it's a very quick process. The great thing about it is you get 100% yield because everything that you've put inside the retort kiln gets turned into charcoal. The other more common method, and the way we're going to do it, is to use a barrel. And then you actually use some of the wood that you want to turn into charcoal as the fuel to drive the process. So rather than the super efficient retort kiln, which has the downside of taking absolutely forever to construct and will cost plenty of money to do so, we're just going to use a simple barrel and fill it full of the wood that we want to turn into charcoal, set fire to that wood and then seal it up, put the fire out and hopefully what will happen is instead of burning properly the wood will smoulder and turn into charcoal that way. So the downside of this barrel method is that we can't achieve that 100% yield of wood to charcoal that you can with a retort kiln but the upside is there's absolutely minimal construction and minimal cost. Right, that's enough theory, <laughs> let's get to work. Here we have three examples of the common or garden oil drum. I've just dragged these out of the brambles. If you're not lucky enough to have a magic bramble patch like me, these are readily available. Um, I'd suggest a local farm or industrial estate, or you can just buy them on eBay. Uh, if you, you don't have to use oil drums, but if you substitute them, just a word of warning, don't use anything galvanized, because once you get some heat and zinc, um, it fumes quite readily and the fumes will make you sick. So <laughs> beware. Two of these I'm going to cut open and punch a load of air holes in and we'll use those for making charcoal. The third I'm going to cut both ends off and that will become a chimney. Over the years I've tried all sorts of ways of opening these up. You can't really use an angle grinder because I want to cut it here on the inside. I want to keep this limp. Uh, the quickest way I've found of doing it is a cutting tool, the uh, oxypropane. It's also the most expensive way. So the method I keep coming back to is a hammer and cold chisel. If you're wondering why it's called a cold chisel, it's because it's for cold cutting metal. 
as opposed to a hot cut which has a much finer point on it. That one's done. This one will become the chimney. We don't need the lip on the end. Of course, the disadvantage of that method is we've got sharp edges here now, but I'm wearing gloves. This one I'm going to cut slightly differently. I'm going to leave it, I'm going to come in about an inch to make the cut. That will leave a bit of a ledge for the other barrel to sit on top of. I'll get this one done and I'll meet you down at the wood pile.